The earlier concluded virtual meeting between Chinese President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden, some say injected some certainty to the China-U.S. relations. But others still wonder how the two countries will proceed from here. Among them, Martin Jacques, a British scholar who studied China for decades. He shared with me his understanding on the key points of the sixth plenary session of the 19th the CPC Central Committee and how China can better communicate with the world at a time of dramatic change and at a time of uncertainty. Martin, you participated online virtually in this Understanding China conference. I know you are frequent there every year, but certainly the level of sophistication to understand China and also the level of patience for China to understand the others' misunderstanding about China has increased, hasn't it? Yes, it has. We've gone backwards. Well, I think it starts with, uh, uh, basically it starts with Trump's election uh, in uh, the end of 2016, and then the shift in the attitude of America towards China, rather than regarding it as a partner, seeing it as a threat. And then you got this um, uh, really uh, drastic retreat into a language which was belonged to the Cold War, really, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, China, China became synonymous with the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party became synonymous with the Soviet Communist Party. Chinese history uh, now, date, now dated from 1949, 2000 years of civilization were lost. Uh, and we were back to the most, you know, simplified and fundamentalist and backward looking view of China. Hmm. Were you surprised, even as a political scientist and a journalist, how things could change? I did think that uh, I did think that at some point relations would become more difficult because uh, the Americans' uh, position on China was based on an illusion uh, that China would westernize and China could not. Uh, sustain its economic growth, and both of these proved to be mistaken. How would you, Martin, uh, assess and analyze China's reactions to it? Uh, mainly, you see the takeaways uh, from the latest uh, Central Committee meeting of the party. How do you see the takeaways of that meeting, and how much do you think it reflects uh, China's mentality in response to what's going on uh, in other parts of the world regarding China or not? Well, I think that it's been very difficult actually for China this period because although uh, there was, I think, some expectation in the party leadership over a long period that this relatively benign relationship between the US and China would not continue indefinitely, uh, that's been, uh, that's, that's been a, a sort of wisdom which has been, been around for some time. But when it actually happens, and the way it happens, of course, it's impossible beyond the point to foresee exactly the form it's going to take. Um, and so I think that uh, and, and the, the, the really aggressive phase of it uh, dates from January uh, 2020 uh, with the pandemic. I mean, it was the weaponizing of the pandemic which did so much by Trump which did so much damage to China's reputation uh, globally. I mean, it was completely fallacious, of course. It was based on a lie, um, but it, you know, lies can do a lot of damage. And uh, in this case, it did. And I think China in that early period in particular, after 2019, found itself on the defensive, on the back foot in, in, in the face of this kind of uh, assault. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I think that uh, has China performed well at dealing with this offensive? I think it's really a, a big learning curve for China. Uh, you know, it, it, China's got to develop, I think, a, a more um, a, a, a more multi-dimensional way of relating, for example, to Western uh, public uh, opinion. And now it needs to develop new tools uh, in order uh, to do this. 
um, uh, and to develop new forms of uh, what should we say subtlety and new a, new, a nuance in relationship uh, to it. You know, I was very critical of the sort of tit for tat approach that seemed to be in vogue for a period, although it's not nearly as true now. So I think China's already learned from that. Subtlety and nuance. Explain more. Well, I think that you know the difficult. The, the difficulty is that when it is you know who you who are you talking to really uh, uh, and and the audience first of all is definitely not chinese you know it, it, in in handling the west the audience uh, has to be uh, a western audience um, but i think too often it's uh, the audience in the mind is a chinese audience so that's one problem uh, secondly what do we mean by Western audience? Well, we don't just mean, you know, governments, prime ministers, presidents, you know, the elite. I think we need, the, really the target audience has to be the people. You know, the way Western politics works, that's very important. And uh, so I think to deal, to, to, to engage uh, with that requires a, a different kind of voice. Uh, uh, a different kind of subtlety, a different kind of nuance and so on. Uh, not a confrontational uh, uh, voice, which I don't think China, by, China occasionally uses a kind of confrontational tone or has done, but uh, I, not, I don't think that's generally the case. Uh, but, it, you know, when you're operating, dealing with ordinary people and so on, it needs a humble tone, it needs to be a concessive tone, it needs to be a convincing tone, uh, it needs to be uh, sometimes some humor in it, which is difficult because humor is very difficult to translate between different cultures and so on. But just generally a kind of, you know, a more knowing approach. I mean, you know, until uh, 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 very, very recently, China was by and large deliberately using a very quiet voice and was not uh, uh, was not strongly asserting its its arguments and uh, its uh, its values and so on and now it's adopting a different approach then it's got to learn how to do that and doing it you can't do it in the same ways as you've been doing it in the in th things in the past so how do you reconcile the two uh phenomenons on the one hand not suggesting China is competing with others in terms of political systems. On the other hand, not shying away from sharing with the rest of the world the great achievements uh, China sees uh, it achieved so far. China's uh, always been very, very clear uh, that it has absolutely no intention of expecting or requiring uh, other countries to adopt its political system. I mean, this is this is this is absolutely fundamental. Uh, to China's approach and has been actually in reality for uh, for uh, a long time. So, you know, we, we're not talking about, for example, the Soviet Union, which did indeed uh, seek to export its model to the world. No, China's not interested in doing that uh, because it China feels that uh, um, it's it, it, the way it's developed its system is very specific to its own history and culture. And it believes that's true for every country. Uh, in the world, which is very different from the American approach, so I think that the Chinese the Chinese position is very clear, and in that sense, completely, uh, uh, in my view, correct and also unthreatening. Um, but at the same time, of course, you know, China uh, 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 needs to uh, establish uh, globally in the global mind, uh, explain its its achievements um, and how well it's done. Um, it's not trying to persuade anyone else to be like it, like it but, it, but it, it, I think it is, while not offering a model to other, others, it does offer lessons. For example, reduction in poverty, extraordinary economic growth, handling the pandemic. I mean, you know, despite the disgraceful uh, arguments by the West to denigrate China from January 2019, the reality is that China has been absolutely brilliant in the way that it's handled the pandemic. And in that case, we can learn much in the West, around the world, uh, from China. Um, so I think there are two, you're right, the, the two arguments could, could, uh, could uh, detract from each other, but they're not, they're, diff they're different. One is, no, we don't want you to be like us. We, 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 
you be like well, however you want to be and this is how we're doing and this is what we've done and this maybe you can learn things from it maybe there's some things that are useful for you that seems to me the correct chinese approach how do you see you know leading up to the winter olympics uh, this has become a big event for many chinese and certainly for sportsmen and women around the world uh, now uh, the political wind does seem to be a little bit challenging so how do you see uh, the prospect uh, the political environment uh, and the social environment for leading up to the games well um obviously uh what what you can see happening is that the the tone of um of public life global public life particularly in the western countries uh, has changed and now uh the attitude towards china has become uh and this is not just at a leadership level has become uh, more negative and even bordering on toxic you know you can feel um you can feel you, know, you can feel the water lapping at the edges of more hostility more sort of cold war acts uh, against china to try and discredit and denigrate china and say china is not shouldn't be part of this and shouldn't be part of that i think that uh, the uh, uh, winter olympics will happen i think they'll be successful i hope the the western countries send their full uh, contingents to it and it's covered you know widely televised and so on as a great event which it, it always has been I'm, and i hope very much that this will be a great success and you know let's remember 2008 the beijing olympics was an enormous success and the chinese uh uh what should we say you know came out smelling of roses from it <laughs> yes uh Finally, before we go, uh, China and the U.S., uh, the top leadership, have already talked virtually. Both sides have pretty much lined out the bottom line, in a way, that is to avoid war, uh, hot war. Um, so, Martin, how do you see the prospect that the bottom line reached by the two sides will be able to carry on uh, for the next uh, uh, year or so when there might be a lot of different uh, political events and uh, and timelines uh, uh, in which uh, things could be happening and changing uh, even beyond our imagination. Yeah, well, we know that we live in very volatile times uh, and the relationship between the United States and China has been in not free fall but has certainly deteriorated a lot across a ho you know in a, all sorts of ways and and this is an ongoing process and we don't know where it's going to lead beyond the point so there's a there's a sort of lack of fundamental lack of stability in the situation and the reason why i think the the, the biden she uh, meeting was very important was to try and establish the sort of you know a line if you like uh where well look you know we we the last thing we want to see either of us either country is some kind of uh, military clash which would be uh, disastrous so we need to build up f uh, an understanding uh from that of what needs to be done and you know on on the military front which hasn't been discussed before china has not been part of those kind of things um unlike the situation of the us and the soviet union then it seems to me that the next uh, one thing that's going to be uh, and uh, I understand the Americans are pushing, and I think the Chinese will be uh, uh, happy to go along with this by and large. Is some kind of understanding uh, on uh, 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 on you know uh, military agreements and uh, uh, hotlines and consultation between the militaries. There's lots of things uh, that can help to build up some pattern of trust, and therefore predictability. You know, with trust comes predictability. With that, no trust means everything becomes uh, very unpredictable um so i think that you know that's that's a good start now i would combine that with the you know a very important us china statement at the end of cop 26 in glasgow 
you know, saying that we need to cooperate and this cannot be achieved without our cooperation and so on. That was good. That, 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 and that is, of course, uh, totally true. Now, is this going to be, you know, is this going to be a line in the sand? Is it going to uh, uh, usher in a different phase? Uh, I, 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 we, none of us know the answer to that, but we can certainly hope. <laughs>